My name is Kyle. I want to say thank you for being here today. If you're visiting, special thanks to you. Um, We're going to be in Romans chapter 1 today. Romans chapter 1. So if you, you have your Bible, you can grab it, open it up to Romans 1. That comes immediately after Acts. Um, anyway, uh, today we're getting into what, uh, what you would call as a, it's, it's a polemic series. Uh, tech, uh, top, sorry, not series, but sermon. Just a one-off sermon, um, and, and we're gonna we're gonna make a stance known today uh, in light of what's coming next month. And so, uh, I'll start that by saying this: New Life Community Church holds the position that God's word is divinely inspired, that it is infallible, and that it is inerrant. God's word is divinely inspired, infallible, and inerrant. Therefore, it is the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions shall be tried. The supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions shall be tried. So, the Word of God is our ultimate authority, in other words. It is our ultimate authority. Authority and everything on earth, including our own hearts, our own opinions, our own wishes and desires, everything on earth must be tried by it. But the world doesn't see it this way. The, the world thinks differently and it approaches it in a different way. The world is going to eagerly and is actively, actually, eagerly attempting to make God's word uninspired to make it fallible, to make it errant, to question the authority. And ultimately what they're attempting to do is to make God's Word irrelevant for ordering creation, ordering our lives, and they're doing it by the pride of their own unbelief. They're doing it by the pride of their own unbelief. So God's Word gives us the answer to why are these things happening? Why does the unbelieving world participate this way? Why do they play the game in this way? Why do they behave this way? In Romans 1, 16 through 32. If you would, would you stand for the reading of God's Word today? When I finish reading, I'll say this is God's holy Word, and you will respond, thanks be to God. We want to show that God's Word is higher than any other thought we have here. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural, natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. 
They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. You can have a seat. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Our God, we know that it has come to us in truth, that it reveals to us faith for faith so that we might know who you are, Father, that we might follow you and walk with you and walk in a manner worthy of the gospel which we've received. And we thank you, Father, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And so, Father, as men and women and boys and girls in here, I pray that you help us to believe wholeheartedly your gospel today. Lord, that we would trust in you and in you alone. And Lord, we pray that you would use your gospel to save sinners, to save those of whom we once were, Father, to relieve them, Father, of their oppression to sin and to help them to know true freedom in Christ alone. Lord, help us to be bold in this message. Help us to be bold in this hour of our day, of our time that we live in. Lord, help us to fight for truth and to stand on it wholeheartedly, unreservedly, boldly. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Half of you had already seated. Half of you had not. We'll, sh- we'll try by the end of the service to walk together more fully, all right? More in unity. Um, the, the unbelieving world lives by the changing tide of individualism. And by this changing tide, what I mean is is that it can go from one place to the next very quickly just simply based on feelings. And by individualism, what they're doing is they're forming their conduct. By whatever they decide is true, they form their conduct, the things they do. They form their creeds, the things they believe, the things they profess, and they form their opinions on what is right or wrong, that uh, the truth is, uh, is subject to change. It's subject to uh, perspective. It's subject to the one who holds it and, and not subject to God. Their, their mantra, if you will. Their creed, if I could write one for them, would be, if it feels good to you, then do it. If it seems right to you, then do it. Christians, however, must form their conduct and creeds and their opinions by the gold standard of God's holy word. We must stand on truth. Our mantra, if I could write one for us, must be, what God instructs, that we shall do. What God instructs, that we shall do. Another way we might sum up what Romans 1 is saying to us today is this, unbelievers boast in their sins while believers boast in their Savior. Unbelievers boast in their sins while believers boast in their Savior. There is a pride of unbelief. There's a pride to this. This is what Paul is writing in Romans 1. It's all about the pride of the man, the pride of the person. And perhaps this is not more evident than what we are seeing regarding beliefs on marriage and sexuality and gender. The the world is engaged in active combat against what God's Word says about marriage and sexuality and gender. The world has set itself against God's Word. But this is not new. This has been going on for millennia. One glaring example of this comes to us each June. One glaring example of this comes flying in our face each June with Pride Month. Pride Month is set aside each year, now this is how they word it, is set aside each year to promote 
the, listen to these words, the self-affirmation, dignity, equality, and increased visibility of the LGBT plus community. The point of what they're saying is that they're taking pride in their chosen way of life rather than feeling shame. That's literally why they call it Pride Month. It's to be proud of who you are. Again, if it feels good to you, then do it. Don't withhold this from yourself. And they proudly say this to one another while the rest of the world cheers them on, including, lately, many ill-informed evangelicals, many Christians. Advocates of pride falsely believe that this is a step forward in the liberation of the LGBT plus community. However, the Scriptures are showing us here that it's simply a giant leap in further hardening their hearts toward God and His Holy Word, which ironically is the only thing that promises true liberation. It's the only thing that promises true salvation. And so thinking they're free, they're becoming more bound, becoming more enslaved to their sin. So what has led men and women to do this for millennia? Well, it's pride. Just good old-fashioned pride. Romans 1, 18-25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the beginning, uh, sorry, the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. I'm just rereading this so we can get it in our minds. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. It's the essence of pride, isn't it? Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the, uh, sorry, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So Paul is saying here that God has shown Himself to the world. That in creation, we clearly see God's eternal power and divine nature. That nature or creation is a witness to the divine nature of God. It's a witness to the eternal power of God. That God has created, and when you look at creation it should, it's meant to, cause you to see that there is a Creator. The world knows God because He has made Himself known. God does, in other words, God does not believe in atheists, as one man has said. God is not a believer in atheists, right? He's saying, I have revealed Myself to man. They know Me, and so there is no one excused from this knowledge of God. God has revealed Himself in creation. And so from the rising and the setting of the sun to the Colorado Rockies, you can see God. From the genders to the formation of a child in the womb, you can see the hand of God. From the tiniest insect to the largest animal, you can see God. All of it and everything in between, which is we haven't nearly exhausted all of creation in my poor examples there, But everything in between all of those things testifies to the glory of God and His creation. And they know this, yet they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Now the idea of suppression here is really, it's really interesting. And and it's what helps us get to the idea of apologetics and what we're after in apologetics, what we're after in proclaiming the truth. So the idea of suppression is this, it's that you're holding something down, all right? So it's, it's summertime. Maybe some of you have had the opportunity to be in a pool already. Maybe you, you've played with a, a beach ball in the pool, right? You take a beach ball, you try to push it under the water, 
I remember as a kid trying to sit on a ball in the water, right? And you're kind of wobbly and it just pops up and flies out of the pool. This is the idea of suppression is that you're, you're pushing down. They are pushing down in their unrighteousness truth. And, and they're just holding it. And they're, they're, they're praying <laughs> if they pray. They're, they're hoping against hope that truth will not fly out of their hands up into the air for all to see. They are suppressing truth. And so in apologetics, one way to do apologetics, one way to talk to an unbeliever who is suppressing truth, one way is to give them more beach balls. (laughs) It's to say, hey, here's more truth, or to make the beach ball larger, right? To where it becomes harder and harder to suppress the truth. This is one way you can do apologetics. You can continue to give evidence of God. Another way to do apologetics is to figure out how you might pry fingers away from the beach ball. And so in unraveling their worldview, you are removing their hand from the beach ball, so to speak. And so the beach ball, by the power of God, hopefully will come to the surface and this will lead to their understanding of their need for a Savior. Does that make sense? And so this is, what, this is the indictment from Paul, the suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness has rendered their thinking useless. That's what he means by futile, that their thinking has become, they've become futile in their, in their thinking, in their minds. What, what Paul is saying is they think they're wise, but they're fools. They think that they have truth, but they're actually suppressing truth, and they're showing that by suppressing their truth, they don't know anything. They're futile in their thinking, actually. It's really a sad thing to behold. I I don't stand here today pridefully gloating over unbelievers. It's heartbreaking that God has been made known to them, and yet in their unrighteousness, they choose to suppress the truth about God and to run headlong into their own idolatry. What Paul is saying here, their arguments are nonsensical. They don't make sense. They're claiming to be wise, yet they became fools. Why? Because they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling creation. In other words, they're created to worship God, and God has made Himself known in creation that they might be able to find God. And ultimately, you find God. God has revealed Himself naturally, but He's revealed Himself supernaturally through His Word. And so we ultimately come to know God intimately through His Word as He saves us from our sins, reveals Himself to us, and we're in right relationship again. But what they've done is even in nature, they're looking into it and they're saying, no, the creative order from God is wrong, and so they're making themselves wise, they've become fools. The way God has designed it is not the way we want to live, and so we ignore it. And they're created to worship God created to walk in fellowship with God, and yet in unrighteousness, they worship man. They worship themselves, worship animals, and all sorts of things. And you see this over and again in unbelievers. It's not just with gender and sexuality and marriage. That's one giant battle, and that's one that Paul sets aside here as one of the the greatest evidences of someone who's been given over to their unnatural passions. But that's not the only battle. There's many battles out there. There there are many things, many instances, I should say, where creation is put over God, where we worship the creation rather than the Creator. Their pride is the center of their unbelief. Their pride is the center of their unbelief. In pride, they claim to be wise, they boast in their sins, believing themselves to be liberated, yet they are fools. They have fooled themselves by buying into the lie of the garden, the same lie that the serpent tells to Eve. If you will eat of this fruit, you will be like God. And so they take the fruit of their own unrighteousness and they eat it. 
and they offer it to others who eat also. And they cheer one another on as they eat the fruit that is leading to impending death. Unbelievers boast in their sins while believers boast in their Savior. Furthermore, after, verses 20, after verse 25, Paul makes it clear that their sinful behavior is so far removed from freedom by showing that it really is the righteous judgment of God. We see that they are under God's judgment as they think they are free. They seek to remove themselves from the rule of God, yet, ironically, they have run headlong into His righteous judgment. Romans 1, 26-32, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. There's uh, really none of us who are left off this list. Though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And so again, claiming to be wise, they become fools. Their minds are darkened, yet they believe that their minds are enlightened. Their hearts are darkened, yet they believe they're living the enlightened experience. They're following, however, their own lust-filled passions has landed them squarely under God's righteous judgment. God gave them up, we read, to dishonorable passions. That is, the idea of Him giving them up to it means He's surrendering them to them. To, to give something up is to be surrendered to someone or to some thing. Gave them up to dishonorable passions. God is surrendering them over to their dishonorable passions. They did not want His authority. They wanted to be their own authority. And so they got what they want. They got what they wanted. They sought it out. They suppressed the truth. They made themselves wise. They claimed that God was a fool. It's obvious, however, back to this idea of Pride Month, it's obvious in the anatomy of a man and a woman that they are made to fit together, that they are made to be one flesh, that they are made for the purpose of being fruitful and multiplying not only in having children, but that's one of the ways. However, the world chooses to ignore God's creative order. The world chooses to establish their own order because they see themselves as God-like. They are their own God. So in their dishonorable passions, men are perversely drawn to men, and women are perversely drawn to women. It's an abomination. It abhors God's Word by its actions and its proclamations. We must be clear on that. God has established the order of the sexes. He did this at creation. Genesis 1.27, we read, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Just a few verses later, a zoomed-in picture of what took place at creation. God creates man from the dust of the ground. He breathes into him life. And then He says that it's not good that man should be alone. And so He creates a woman from the side of the man, from the rib of a man, of the man. And in verse 24 of chapter 2 of Genesis, we read this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Again, it's clear 
the creative order here. And it's clear how the world has turned it upside down. From these two verses alone, we can rightly conclude that God created mankind, male and female, in his own image, and God created marriage to be between a man and his wife. But the unbelieving world hates these truths. That's the product of pride in their unbelief. But remember what Jesus said. We just read this last week, but I'm going to remind you again. What Jesus said about the light and the lovers of darkness. John 3, 19 through 20, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. and He's saying that the light has come into the world, but they hated the light. He says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. Again, it's the same principle here. They are lovers of themselves. They're lovers of their own sinful desires. They're lovers of their own darkness. And foolishly, they think that their darkness is light. They think that their darkness is liberation. They think that their darkness is freedom. And yet they're bound to walk in the darkness until the light is revealed to them. But the judgment is that the light is here. Truth is here. God has made himself known in the face of Christ Jesus. In him, we have the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of the Father. And he has made known to us truth. His apostles have made known to us truth by the Spirit of God who instructed them after Christ ascended into heaven. And so we see that God uh, has given them up to dishonorable passions as an act of judgment. We also read that God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. The the, the, the word debased here means morally reprehensible, which we see in their perverted views of gender, sexuality, and marriage, but it's also seen in their character. Again, these verses, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. I won't read the whole list again, but it's evil, malice, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, slanders, haters of God, haughty, boastful, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. You get the point. All manner of unrighteousness. And so there is nothing righteous in them, which Paul will go on to say explicitly in Romans 3. Just... Two chapters later, he'll say that there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks the Lord. And so there's nothing righteous in them. They've gotten exactly what they wanted. That's part of the judgment. They know God's righteous decree. They know that those who practice such evil deserve to die. And yet, not only do they do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Misery loves company doesn't it? There's always room at the table of the unrighteous scoffer. There's always a seat there. That unrighteous scoffer will deride you and your high view of God's Word. He'll deride you and your attempts to be obedient to the Word of God, especially when you fail. That scoffer will try every way he can to break you down and to draw you in, if he can, to his own evil actions, to his own scoffing. But I tell you that Psalm 1 promises the man who will stand on the righteous decrees of God, the man who will stand on God's instruction, there's a promise there for him and and for her. That the one who will trust God's word, the one who will meditate on it day and night, the psalmist says, that he will become like a tree that is firmly planted beside a flowing stream that bears fruit in due season. It is unshaken. He will not be moved, and he says he will not be moved because God knows his way. In other words, God keeps him in safety because the righteous one has hidden himself in God. This is what you're doing when you stand on the Word of God, is you're hiding yourself under the safety of the Trinity. 
You're hiding yourself under God. You're placing yourself under His care and under His provision, and you're saying, Father, my life, I count not my own. I am Yours, and I trust You fully. And I'm going to stand on Your Word. Regardless of what the world around me does, I'm going to walk with you. And so I urge you, brothers and sisters, do not be swayed by the ways of the world. Do not be swayed by the cunning attempts, the cunning arguments, the attractiveness of it all, that we should preach an all-inclusive message that God saves everyone, whether they believe or not. That all roads lead to heaven as long as you're a good person. I'm telling you, deny those things. Stand on the Word of God because no one's getting into heaven believing those things. It's unloving to affirm people in such foolishness. Do you hear me? It's unloving to affirm people in that. You cannot say that you love your neighbor and support their sins. You can't do that. It's unloving to do this. It's unloving to dismiss Scripture for your neighbor and to say, sure, do what feels right. There's no love in that. You might sound loving. You might feel loving. But the truth is there's no love in it at all. Ephesians 4 tells us to speak the truth in love, so that we are not those kind of people who are tossed to and fro by every cunning argument, every wind of doctrine, every foolish belief. It says to speak the truth in love so that every member, talking now about the body of Christ, every member is strengthened, every member is given the ability to grow. And so if I'm standing on foolish doctrines and my dear sister, Miss Tracy, comes to me and says, Kyle, I I love you, (laughs) but you're being an idiot right now. (laughs) I need to hear that. Right? I mean, this is what the body of Christ is for. And so I'll ask, well, how? (laughs) In what ways? And she'll explain them to me. And I pray that the Lord would open my eyes to hear, uh, open my eyes to see, open my my ears to hear His truths in those moments of reproof, of rebuke. This is part of what the body of Christ is for. So I'm encouraging you today, do not be swayed. Do not soften your stance on the trustworthiness and the faithfulness of God's eternal Word. I want to attempt to provide some further clarity by reading to you some affirmations and denials of a statement that we've signed as a church. It's called the Nashville Statement on Biblical Sexuality. You can find this on our website under our beliefs. I don't know if you've read this or not. It's, we've had it up for a while now, well over a year. Um, but it, there's some affirmations and denials here that will help clarify what we're saying. And so I'm going to read some of these to you. These are things that we believe as an elder team. These are things we believe as a church. We affirm that God designed marriage to be a covenantal, sexual, procreative, lifelong union of one man and one woman as husband and wife, and is meant to signify the covenant love between Christ and His bride, the church. Amen. We deny that God designed marriage to be a homosexual, polygamous, or polyamorous relationship. We also deny that marriage is a mere human contract rather than a covenant made before God. We affirm that God's revealed will for all people is chastity outside of marriage and fidelity within marriage. We deny that any affections, desires, or commitments ever justify sexual intercourse before or outside marriage, nor do they justify any form of sexual immorality. We affirm that God created Adam and Eve, the first human beings in His own image, equal before God as persons and distinct as male and female. We deny that the divinely ordained differences between male and female render them unequal in dignity or worth. We affirm 
that divinely ordained differences between male and female reflect God's original creation design and are meant for human good and human flourishing. We deny that such differences are a result of the fall or are a tragedy to be overcome. We affirm that the differences between male and female reproductive structures are integral to God's design for self-conception as male or female. We deny that physical anomalies or psychological conditions nullify the God-appointed link between biological sex and self-conception as male or female. We affirm that those born with a physical disorder of sex development are created in the image of God and have dignity and worth equal to all other image bearers. They are acknowledged by our Lord Jesus in his words about eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. With all others, they are welcome as faithful followers of Jesus Christ and should embrace their biological sex insofar as it may be known. We deny that ambiguities related to a person's biological sex render one incapable of living a fruitful life in joyful obedience to Christ. We affirm that self-conception as male or female should be defined by God's holy purposes in creation and redemption as revealed in Scripture. We deny that adopting a homosexual or transgender self-conception is consistent with God's holy purposes in creation and redemption. We affirm that people who experience sexual attraction for the same sex may live a rich and fruitful life pleasing to God through faith in Jesus Christ as they, like all Christians, walk in purity of life. We deny that sexual attraction for the same sex is part of the natural goodness of God's original creation or that it puts a person outside the hope of the gospel. We affirm that sin distorts sexual desires by directing them away from the marriage covenant and towards sexual immorality, a distortion that includes both heterosexual and homosexual immorality. We deny that an enduring pattern of desire for sexual immorality justifies sexually immoral behavior. We affirm that it is sinful to approve of homosexuality, immorality, or transgenderism, and that such approval constitutes an essential departure from Christian faithfulness and witness. We deny that the approval of homosexual immorality or transgenderism is a matter of moral indifference about which otherwise faithful Christians should agree to disagree. Again, unbelievers boast in their sins while believers boast in their Savior. Now, the truly sad part of all of this is the unbelievers' attempt to liberate themselves by their own passions. Because in it, they are bound, they are as bound as they've ever been, and maybe more bound, maybe more so. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ promises liberation and freedom from sins. The gospel alone is the power of God unto salvation. Paul began this section with a reminder to these Roman believers. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Gentile, or and to, also to the Greek. Verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so what Paul is saying is the gospel is the saving power of God in which the righteousness of God is revealed. To, to capture the gravity and the weight of what Paul is saying, of this statement to these believers in this first century moment, we, you must consider the context here. That the Christians who are in Rome, who Paul is writing to, they're living under the rule of Rome's power and, and their influence. And, and because Rome's power and influence was far and wide, and it was brutal toward Christians in many ways, many Christians lost their lives at the hands of Roman soldiers under the rule of guys like Nero. In that moment, as your brothers and sisters are literally being torn limb from limb or set on fire, it would be very tempting to be ashamed of the gospel due to the lack of your own size, the lack of your own fame, and the lack of your own honor. It would be very easy to say, well, let me just hide my little light under this bushel here. 
But Paul's statement reminds these Roman Christians that they possess a power that is greater than the power of Rome, which is that the, the one that is executing them. They, they possess the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, this <clears throat> is... I'm not going to be able to finish it. We'll start over. <clears throat> I've been fighting it. I thought I could make it. <clears throat> they possess the power of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, this is the power of God which is able to save sinners. It's able to save all of those who believe. In verse 17, he reminds them that by the proclamation of the gospel, faith is revealed for faith, or faith is revealed unto faith, we might say. <clears throat> Salvation by faith alone, comes from the gospel alone. Paul makes this point very, very clear in Romans chapter 10, where he says out loud, he's writing this for them to read, and, and he says this, he says, how will they believe unless someone carries the good news? And how will the good news be heard unless someone preaches the good news? And then he says that faith comes, he's talking about saving faith, faith comes from the hearing, and the hearing comes from the Word of God. And so the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, and it must be told so that it must be heard, so that it might be believed. If you today are alive in Christ, as we looked at over the last 12 weeks or so, maybe it was longer than that, if you are alive in Christ today, it's because of your belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's because of salvation by the grace of God that's come to you. And, and so you are truly alive. You have eternal life now. And I, I want you to walk in that life each day. God has called you to new life that you might walk with Him among the unbelieving world. God does not save you and take you. He saves you and commissions you to go into all the world and to proclaim the good news of Christ, to teach all that He commands, baptizing believers. You're commissioned by God to do this because it's by that message and it's by that faith that people will be saved. You and I must receive this same truth today that Paul is telling the Romans here. As the world turns headlong and runs over the cliffs of self-expression and individualism, you and I, you and I must refuse to make gods of man and take up the flag of the gospel and run toward faithfulness to God. Run toward eternal life. How many of you have seen The Patriot? Mel Gibson, The Patriot, not the... the uh, <laughs> never mind. I can't remember his name, but I almost said Sylvester Stallone. But uh, the other guy, the, the karate man. What's his name, Jasper? You know movies. Anyway. What? Yeah, Steven Seagal, yeah. Didn't, wasn't he in a movie called The Patriot or something also? I don't remember. Anyway, not important. But in The Patriot with Mel Gibson, the one that really matters right now. Mel Gibson plays a guy named Benjamin Martin who's a militia leader. And, and he didn't want to even join the war, but he joins the war because his sons are brutally killed in front of him. And, and so at the end, in the, in the final battle scene of this movie, the, the red coats are advancing, they're winning the battle, the blue coats are beginning to retreat, and Mel Gibson's kind of surveying the scene as he's coming to, and he's looking around, and, and the movie's playing in slow-mo, you know, to capture the, all of that. And, and Martin goes and he grabs a, a patched-up American flag 
and, and you, you can probably see the visual in your mind if you've seen it, but he, he begins to run toward the battle. He just grabs the flag, he takes off running toward the, the, toward the battle. He, he's running opposite of these warriors who are retreating. But in doing so, he inspires them to turn and to keep fighting. That, that's the kind of faith that you and I are to have in this age of unchecked pride. You're to have the kind of faith that goes against the grain. That, that goes against the afraid, the fearful, the worried, the scared, the nervous. That goes against all the ones who are running away because the world's attacks are too much. You're to have the kind of faith that is strong amid a time when there is little faith. And you're to run against the grain. You're to carry the flag of the gospel in this time. You're not alone in this. I mean, if you need courage for this, read Acts. Read Philippians. Read First and Second Peter. Read First, Second, Third John. <laughs> read Revelation. Read the Gospels, read all of the epistles, read your New Testament is what I'm saying today. Your brothers and sisters who started this whole thing, whom you now stand on the shoulders of, have been fighting this battle, fought this battle long before us. And we are well equipped by the word that God gave them for us. We are well equipped by the same Spirit of God that was alive in them is alive in us. The same Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead is our Spirit. It's the one who dwells in us. We are His temple. You can fight the fight with boldness. You can run the race without fear. And Paul in Philippians 1.27, he's writing from prison and he's encouraging the church at Philippi in the midst of their great persecution that they're enduring. And this is what he says in verses 27 through 30. He says, only let your manner of, of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, live in such a way that you show you believe. Let it be worthy of the gospel you've received. And he says, so that whether I come and see or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And listen to verse 28. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. Not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Well, what's a clear sign? The fact that you are walking worthy of the gospel, that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and so you are not frightened. You're not frightened by them. And when the world looks on, when your opponents look on, declaring themselves wise, thinking you to be a fool, and they see a church a people who are immovable because of their belief in the gospel of Christ. It's a billboard for them of death. It's one way, one more way, that the Lord might arrest their attention and so save them. Not frightened in anything by your opponents, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. So again, in standing firm, striving side by side with one mind, it's a confirmation that you are in Christ. And so it's important that we have one another in these kinds of days. And then in verse 29, he says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. So this is one more way you can take joy in your trials, as James says in chapter 1 is knowing that your trials, your sufferings, have come to you from God. So that 
You can suffer for the sake of Christ, which is one more identity mark that you are in Christ. If you are living a life that is free of suffering in all ways, you experience no suffering at all, no kickback for your beliefs, then you need to ask yourself, am I really standing for anything? I'm not saying you go out and be intentionally disruptive and try to stir up stuff. But if you're not cowering amid conversations with coworkers and employees or friends or roommates or spouse, children, whatever, then you're going to experience some friction for your beliefs in Christ. And so if there is no friction, there may be There may be not much evidence outside of in your heart to your belief. You should be more bold. You should take a stand. And he says, you're engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. And so by engaging in these things, you are identifying yourself with Christ, with the Apostle Paul, and with all those who have gone before you. You do not stand alone. It's in Hebrews that we read about the great cloud of witnesses <clears throat> that we have to these truths and to the things that we stand for. And so in light of God's verdict on humanity, as we've seen in Romans 1 today, the gospel must gain urgency in your life. It must gain urgency in your life. Behind the good news of the gospel lies the tough news, the difficult news, the bad news, if you will that all people are implicated in acts and attitudes that God has promised to punish unless His means of grace are embraced. And so the gospel is the antidote. Because it's through trust in Christ that obedience of faith comes, which is the kind of believing that God requires. Obedience of faith. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And so as you look on the pride of unbelief that is on display in our world today, do not envy it, do not support it, but stand firm on the gospel of Christ. Pray for the salvation of sinners by the grace of God as you boldly witness to the saving power of the gospel with unbelievers. Again, here's some affirmations, just a few more affirmations and denials from the Nashville Statement on Biblical Sexuality in regards to how we live with these truths. We affirm, that our, duty to, uh, we affirm our duty to speak the truth and love at all times, including when we speak to or about one another as male or female. We deny any obligation to speak in such ways that dishonor God's design of his image bearers as male and female. In other words, refuse to use the pronouns. Refuse to. We affirm that the grace of God in Christ gives both merciful pardon and transforming power, and that this pardon and power enable a follower of Jesus to put to death sinful desires and to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Praise God. We deny that the grace of God in Christ is insufficient to forgive all sexual sins and to give power for holiness to every believer who feels drawn into sexual sin. We affirm that the grace of God in Christ enables sinners to forsake transgender self-conceptions and by divine forbearance to accept the God-ordained link between one's biological sex and one's self-conception as male or female. We deny that the grace of God in Christ sanctions self-conceptions that are at odds with God's revealed will. We affirm that Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners and that through Christ's death and resurrection, forgiveness of sins and eternal life are available to every person who repents of sin and trust in Christ alone as Savior, Lord, and supreme treasure. We deny, I love this one, that the Lord's arm is too short to save or that any sinner is beyond His reach. Amen. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Believe it, brothers and sisters. Proclaim it. 
It is the thing that liberates sinners finally forever. Amen? Remember, unbelievers are going to boast in their sins, but our duty is to boast in our Savior. Would you stand and pray with me today? Gracious Heavenly Father, we have heard Your Word today. Now help us to receive Your Word. Lord, would You, by Your Spirit, allow us to believe Your Word wholeheartedly, to remember it, to process it, to live it, Father. Help us to be the kind of men and women who understand that unbelievers running headlong into their lustful behaviors, desires, are actually under your judgment. And that this is a terrifying thing. Father, would you give us an urgency to proclaim the gospel to friends and to family members, to those around us, who we know do not know You. Would You open a door for us, Father, to talk about our God, to talk about Your salvation, to talk about the freedom we now have from sin, the ability we have to hide ourselves in Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Our sins are washed away. We are free forever from their guilt and their shame. And Father, we ask that You would use Christians around the world, but Christians in our nation, a remnant, Father, of Christians who will proclaim Your Word, who will stand for truth, who will save people from the deranged behavior that is being applauded today. The things that are being done to children in the name of this movement are unimaginable. The places that this has yet to go, if we keep running down this road, are unthinkable. Lord, we need you. We need a move of your spirit. Heavenly Father, use your people for that. Use us. Begin it here in Columbia County. Help us, Lord, to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Christ faithfully. Lord, we thank you that you've commissioned us to go. You've commissioned us to live in this world as Christians. And Lord, not only have you commissioned us, but you've equipped us by your Spirit to do just that. Help us to raise the flag, to raise the banner of the gospel high, that all may see it, that sinners may be drawn unto it and receive salvation in your name. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the salvation we have. Forgive us, Lord, of timidity. Forgive us, Lord, where we have lacked boldness or where we have thought that we don't know enough to say anything. Forgive us, Lord, for the times where we have just tried to get along. Lord, none of that is going to save sinners. Help us, Father. Help us, Lord, to be, to be soul winners for your name. Lord, we pray these things according to the name of Christ who has saved us. We ask that you work them into us. Amen.